Mubarak University Press and the United Nations Environmental Program, Faithful Earth Initiative. Once again, welcome. Uh, we have a rich program in store for all of us. And uh, to quickly set it out, we're going to begin by an opening invocation by uh, our chaplain, Kabarak University, Reverend Justice Mutuko. Welcome. Reverend Mutuko, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you some. Um, I think uh, we lost the Reverend for a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, in that case, allow me then to quickly begin our opening opening remarks as we await uh, Reverend Mutoku to join us once again. At this point, please allow me to to invite the Dean Kabara Law School, Professor John Osogwambani, to give us the first opening remarks and also to welcome our uh, Dr. Iyad, the director, UNEP Faith for Earth Initiative. Professor Ambani, welcome. Yes, Sam. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mushiri and the, the round table. Um, I hope it can be round on, on, on Zoom. Um, can you see me and can you hear me as well? Or I need to do more adjustments? Yes, we can. Yes, we can, Prof. You can see me and hear me. Okay, great. Um, I, I, I believe that uh, um, I have observed the, the, the protocol of your meeting, um, which is maybe something we should have said beforehand. Uh, but if, if, it, if, it, if there's none that has been said, kindly just allow that uh, I proceed by recognizing um, that I really appreciate the friendship that we have with UNEP, um, with interreligious groups, um, and to thank especially UNEP and Kabarak University Press for starting this conversation. Um, I think I'm really happy with it. Um, an interreligious, um, you know, and also state or multi state conversation on faith and the protection of the environment. Um, why I'm very pleased with it is because um, of my belief that it is easier to bring people on board if you enter their conversation through their comprehensive doctrine. Um, many of us are not able to evolve philosophy. I think philosophy is for very high-end scholars or maybe philosophers who then are able to have philosophies of life. Um, most of us operate on um, a doctrine that we inherit, even religious or cultural, and that becomes the philosophy or the lenses through which we look at the world. And so when you strike at that point, which is, I think, what faith is about, uh, then you have actually struck at the right place. And it's quite easy to get cooperation. Uh, it's quite easy to get people to, to engage, especially on an important environment, and an and, and, and important issue like environment, when you also resonate with their comprehensive doctrine. In this case, I believe the faiths of our people. Um, just as a way of remarks, if it is possible again, and if I'm allowed, I could also refer to some experiences I have had, and it would be very anecdotal, to be very informal, very unscholarly, just three, four experiences. And then I hope that could be enough to start, uh, um, you know, rolling the discussion forward. Um, the first three uh, things I experienced, um, you know, firsthand, um, and one of them was just growing up, say, among the Cabras people of Kakamega at some point in my life. And 
it always fascinated me how the elders knew their animals by name. Um, the cows actually had names and, and, and the good shepherds are the ones who knew their cows, whether it is goats or sheep by name. And they called them by name and they followed them. And in fact, the most experienced shepherds did not even use a stick. Um, the animals respected them. And I remember um, that sometimes a person was so affected when their animal died uh, that I would be bothered as a young boy uh, how the death of an animal affected this old man or this elder that much. But I think it's more because they understood the connection uh, between them and the animals that they kept. I also remember as a child that there was a tree in my grandfather's backyard um, that was the tallest in the entire region. Um, by region, I mean village. You know, the village is too big to village as they think it's a region. Um, but it was so big that whenever, even as children, we got lost, we looked to that tree to get our direction back to home. Back home. Um, and then it reached a level when people thought the tree was too, too huge. They thought that it, it had become a, a possible disaster um, in case it, it collapses because it could fall on trees and households. And um, at that point, I realized that it was not easy to cut that tree. It wasn't as easy as bringing in a machine, um, you know, and cutting it down. I realized that conversations were being had beyond just the act of cutting. And one conversation that was being done or held was that apparently that kind of tree cannot be cut because it's older than everyone else, it's taller than everyone else, and that uh, a ritual had to be done. And I remember that it took probably six, seven years later uh, before that tree could be cut, and the ceremony had to be done to fell that tree. Um, and I began to see that there could actually also be a connection then between our culture and environmental protection because some trees had survived simply because and only because people were not ready to cut them and because further consultations were needed before they could be cut. Then I also grew up and talked to some Maasai friends when um, I was a bit older in Kajado. And they also told me similar stories uh, than the, that, uh, you know, like the ones I'd experienced. For example, that a young, a young man, for example, had a limit to how many animals they could kill. So you don't, you don't, you don't destroy lizards, don't uh, kill flies unnecessarily, because the more you kill or uh, destroy animals, the more you limited the number of animals you could uh, destroy, which meant that one, when you're finally attacked, for example, by a real threat, you lack capacity to act. And it just began to amaze me how in faith, how in culture, how in tradition, we could find effective tools, effective philosophies that are deeply held by the people, but then which could also be used to protect our environment. And I thought that maybe that is why this conversation is relevant. And that is why we must take it forward and take it stronger and look deeper and deeper among our people, especially our traditional cultures. And, and just to see um, what is in there that can be taken forward. But at the heart of it all, I saw something that was special about our people. I'm talking about the African people um, that even science could not explain. And it was this, um, that when, when I began studying biology, you know, you're, you're told they're living things and you're told that living things, are, they're living things and they're non-living things and living things are like human beings and there are the others, like plants. You're not told in science that um, the other species actually have life. They also have a spirit in them and that you should respect their spirit, which is, I think, a point that the African traditions emphasize a lot. Um, people have also criticized um, other faiths for maybe failing to protect the environment within their theology. But I think I'm a bit conversant with the Christian faith and I can mention, as I conclude, maybe one illustration I got there that I think could be useful also as a starting point for discussing even complex, um, complex principles, like for example, intergenerational equity or even sustainable development. Um, I'll mention the story of Noah, for example, um, and, and the re-entry into the ark. Um, I, I believe all of us have context because it's a famous story. And uh, we have an instance where the entire world has just been destroyed by a flood. 
Um, but even as that happens, and it's actually easy to say that the God of Noah then is a God that destroys, but that is only if you for, for, if you forget one uh, particular uh, you know background information that was relevant to this story, and is the one that I'm interested in, which is that before that, Noah is asked to enter into the ark, and Noah is asked to ensure that every species gets into the ark, you know, two one by one. So, to, and, and I believe that was to ensure that the intergenerational equity continues, that uh, animals continue to breed, that the future sees these animals also. And so female and female, and I think that's what the Bible records, whether it was the birds, whether it was the four-legged animals, whether it was the winged, whether it was the, you know, you know the, all those kinds of animals that were getting in were getting in pairs to ensure that they can actually reproduce once sanity has returned. And I think for me, that could also be a principle that we can take from that faith. I would be happy to hear more conversations from the other groups, uh, but I think just to emphasize the point that I believe in our comprehensive doctrines, whether they be traditional African, uh, Christian, uh, is, uh, Islamic or Arabic, um, we can begin to find rallying points where we can rally for a safe and secure environment for all of us in the future. Having said that again, just to encourage all of us, and again, to thank the UNEP and the Cabrera University Press for putting us together and starting this great conversation. I believe that's a good way to start, Mushiri. Ah, yes, it is, Prof. Thank you so much for the Thank wonderful you. open remarks. I believe they set a good pace to the conversations you are about to have this afternoon. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You uh, just before we welcome our Dr. Yad, our director, Sorry, Prof. My apologies. There seems to be an issue on my end. Can you all hear me? We can hear you well. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as I was mentioning, before we welcome uh, Dr. Yad, allow me to recognize and acknowledge the presence of our guests uh, that have continued to stream in. Uh, just to mention a few, we now have uh, Reverend Justice Mutuku back with us here, uh, Chaplain Kabarak University. We also have uh, Mr. Kamran Shizad, the Director, Islam Foundation for Ecology and Environmental Sciences. We have uh, Dr. Hassan Kinyo Mari as well, Lecturer, Religious Studies University of Nairobi. And uh, together with Dr. Lawrence Oseji that is also with us. And we are honored to have uh, all of you join us this afternoon. Uh, so at this point, please allow me to welcome Dr. Yad, Director UNEP Faith for Earth Initiative. After which I think uh, I will welcome the session chair for the first session. We'll invite the opening invocation and the rest of the program. Thank you very much, Dr. Yad. Thank you very much, uh, Samson. Uh, greetings of uh, peace and prosperity to all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ambani, for the beautiful stories you have mentioned and you reminded us of many of the common understandings that most of our religions uh, do agree with. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, many and several of my friends and colleagues are uh, online today listening to this and participating in the discussions. I'm also delighted and uh, really uh, happy that uh, we have started it, the collaboration between Kabarak University Press and uh, the United Nations Environment Program, the Faith for Earth Initiative. Uh, something that we have been talking about uh, for some time and now it is happening and taking place and uh, we are kicking it off and, and to, to a, a successful uh, completion, uh, God's willing. 
Um, it is very important uh, for all of us. Uh, Professor Ambani has um, eloquently highlighted how the environment is related to uh, traditional knowledge, to religions and indigenous knowledge and, and so on. And of course, um, we all know by heart now uh, that all the scriptures of, of almost all religions do touch upon uh, environment and nature and the relationship between humans and the environment, which is the most important uh, element that we are discussing. What is our relationship and what is our responsibility uh, towards the environment and the creation of, of God and the divine? Um, but it is also important that in a contemporary world where uh, science is leading um, you know, everything that we believe in. Um, if you want to uh, develop a policy, it will have to be a science-based policy. If you want to uh, manufacture a car, it has to be based on science and, and, science and physics and, and motion and mobility and so on. Uh, if you go to a doctor, you go to a doctor who has a uh, scientific background of uh, the diseases and, and the treatments and medications and, and so on. But also, uh, in addition to science, there are centuries old uh, traditional knowledge that um, have for, for centuries have uh, molded the behavior of, of people. And that is, of course, their uh, convictions and, and uh, religious beliefs and understandings, as well as their indigenous and cultural beliefs. Um, these are not alternatives. These are uh, things that are uh, can be supportive and should be uh, used as a supportive mechanism to uh, anything that is scientifically based. So what is more beautiful that we connect both together, uh, the sciences and the religious understandings and teachings and traditional uh, knowledge. And this is why uh, UNEP Faith for Earth have, since it started, adopted a uh, one of its goals to uh, bridge the common understanding and bring science and religions and religious uh, understandings and, and studies together. And we have uh, been formulating the Science uh, and Religion Consortium, which was officially launched last uh, February during the United Nations Environment Assembly. And we have been uh, communicating and cooperating with uh, dozens of universities at the global level, universities, scholars, and, and scientists. And the whole purpose is to bring those two powers together, the power of religion and the power of uh, science. Um, but bringing them together would require uh, you know, means uh, for the implementation and substantive input and output uh, that takes us to where we want to be. And this is why we saw in the partnership with Kabarak University Press, a golden opportunity to put that into practice, meaning that the studies that the university with our support will be doing will contribute to uh, informing the international community on the role of religions and religious beliefs uh, in environmental governance. And we know that environmental issues are becoming a, at the center of everything. Even uh, during conflicts nowadays, uh, the first thing that, uh, you know, in addition to the, the harm uh, conflicts uh, cause on humans, uh, the second thing is the harm that is caused on uh, the environment. So it, it, it has become a central piece of the attention of the international community. So we do need a lot of research. Um, although over the past 20 or so years, um, some good uh, studies have been conducted on ecology and theology and religions. Uh, some platforms have been established, but we still need a lot more research, specifically as we are uh, focusing more and more into specific environmental issues. So 
Um, in general, we know the relationship between the environment and religions, but we need to know the relationship between climate change, ecosystems destruction, biodiversity, sustainable consumption and production, uh, marine ecosystems, plastic pollution, and religions, all of those with uh, their relationship with the religions, but also environmental governance. Environmental governance is um, you know, what uh, motivates governments, member states, to adopt policies that contribute to environmental uh, protection, uh, which is the title of this uh, session or this partnership. So we need to understand what is environmental governance and how it is related to uh, religious beliefs and religious actions and, and, and practices. Um, our the, the, One of the main environmental governance avenues that uh, we manage at the, Uni the United Nations Environment Program is the United Nations Environment Assembly, which is the highest level uh, environmental governance body uh, that is that exists and, and adopts uh, decisions and resolutions that are uh, of global nature and mobilizes global action. So we are very happy that uh, over the past five years, we have been able to bring in uh, religions and religious uh, scholars and, and actors into the policy dialogue with uh, politicians and and uh, you know scientists as as well. Um, so this is one avenue that we have been creating. The multilateral environmental agreements, uh, such as UNFCCC or CBD for biodiversity, or uh, UNF UNCCD for uh, disaster um, for for desertification. Uh, we have been facilitating the integration of religious understandings and contributions to these uh, important multilateral environmental agreements, which are a part of the environmental governance system. Uh, but, you know, the most important thing is to work at the national and regional level. And, and I hope um, through this partnership, we could touch upon and these, especially in Africa, where not only, uh, you know, uh, global and uh, major religions like Abrahamic religions play a role, but also the indigenous uh, uh, religions that are indigenous to Africa have uh, contributed in the past and, and should continue to contributing to the understandings of the people. And as, as uh, Professor Ambani mentioned, change the behavior of the people, because we know that behavioral change is a must if we want to change the consumption and production unsustainable consumption and production uh, patterns by, by people, which is leading to wherever we are under uh, the different environmental uh, themes. So um, I am very happy that we are starting this. I am, I, I, I am on leave, in fact, but I, I insisted to be with you uh, because this is very important and I wanted to be you know, uh, with you uh, launching it uh, so allow me if I disappear in a few minutes because I'm, I'm, I'm going to the airport to enjoy the rest of my vacation. So thank you very much and uh, God bless you and good luck for all uh, the efforts that uh, uh, are in front of you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Yad, for taking time out of your leave. And our apologies for calling you out of, uh, out of that special time for you. We particularly appreciate uh, your elaboration of uh, the partnership and the journey that uh, seems to just begin uh, in terms of uh, connecting uh, faith-based values and action with uh, environmental governance and policy. And perhaps on the same note, uh, uh, you'd all allow me to introduce to us uh, the content of uh, the first session and in brief also of the second session uh, that you are about to engage in. In the first session, we will uh, hear from uh, the various speakers on uh, the nexus between faith and environment. That is the connection between faith-based practices and environmental governance that have been in place since the time of indigenous beliefs and continue to, uh, to take action and to manifest in the various communities, in the various societies that we live in. After this session, we will then investigate, as uh, Dr. Yad has intimated, ways in which we can take advantage of the connection between faith-based values and environmental governance, particularly 
in um, international environmental policy and in international environmental protection uh, from the national level to the regional level up to the international level. So uh, at this point, uh, just before we begin the session, please allow me to invite uh, our chaplain, Reverend Mutuku, for the opening invocation, after which uh, I shall invite Mrs. Myra, the coordinator of Faith and Ecosystems uh, under UNEP Faith for Earth, to take us through the first session. Reverend Mutuku, welcome. Thank you, Sam. Would you enable me to share the screen kindly? All right. I'm good. That is that visible? Ah, uh, yes, it is. Thank you. I only want to read a portion from the Christian scriptures. Um, indicating the power as the chairperson Iyad has talked about uh, the power of, uh, of environment. Uh, there's the Christian scriptures in Psalm 19, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the hands of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like the bridegroom coming forth for his, from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. These are basically thoughts about how nature becomes a partaker in what we do, but also in connecting us with our divine. May our conversation today bring this into reality as we converse regarding the whole issue of environmental management. Let us seek God's guidance in prayer. Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, we thank you so much that we are the products of the work of your creative activity. And today we converge not as denominations, not as individual religious affiliations, but as a community of men and women created by a great God to converse on how we can become effective managers and as good stewards of the environment that you have entrusted unto us. Guide us through these to the end, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank you very much, Reverend Mutuko, for the insightful invocation. And uh, right about now, I'd like to welcome uh, Mrs. Myra, Coordinator of Faith and Ecosystems, UNEP Faith for Earth, to take us through the first session, Interreligious Dialogues on Faith and Environment from our uh, various practitioners. Thank you Mrs. Very much. Myra. I'm just checking that you can hear me. Great. Uh, yes, we can. Um, if you'll allow us now to move on to uh, Dr. Hassan Kinyo Omari, who is the lecturer of religious studies at the University of Nairobi, um, to introduce us to this area of faith and environment in the Muslim tradition. Um, Dr. Hassan Omari, the floor is yours. Dr. Hassan, are you with us? Are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, perhaps one of the hosts can unmute him. I think he had, he had sent a text there saying something like, uh, greetings of peace. Please allow me to join without speaking. I realize my audio has issues. I think there was a text on the chat from Hassan Omari, is that the same person? Okay, it appears that uh, Dr. Hassan, there we go, that Dr. Hassan has some audio issues. So while he sorts that out, um, perhaps we can turn to Reverend Justice Mujuku 
um, on his presentation on how Christian theology uh, discourages environmental degradation. Sorry. Sami, uh, is that visible? Yes, it is. All right, let me run through this. I, I'm sharing from the Christian point of view on the subject, how Christian theology discourages environmental degradation. Um, as you've seen, I will not stay in the, the, the details of my names. Uh, we've been introduced, but let me run quickly uh, because of the interest of time. Let me st start by mentioning that Christian theolo theology is rooted on two dimensions. One is on God's revelation, which is found in scripture. And the scripture holds that God is the source of all creation and everything else. And is also angered in what we call the nature, which is the creative nature, which reveals the creative nature of God and his, his manifestation. From its inception, Christian theology has been evolving in its nature and in practice, mainly because of its experience in encountering with the emerging realities of our societies time after time. And those realities demand response from the Christian point of view. Andrew, um, Paul Woods, one of the greatest writers on the subject of the first among equals, comparing Christian theology and modern philosophy, observed something about one of the greatest Christian historian, Andrew Woz, when he says, Andrew Woz has shown that theology is created at the boundaries, has Christian faith expounds into new territory and encounters new situations, philosophies, and worldview. At that convergence, Christians find themselves engaging and developing a theology of what, how they understand that. Theology in nature is contextual, and the fact that it's contextual, it means that Christian theology must be all-encompassing in its approach. In other words, it must bring into consideration and the conversation all the contextual actors without sidelining any of the actors. However, it must be clear that Christians also keep preserving what we call the essentially inviolate set of core truths as they interact or as Christian theology interacts with the broader context in that matter. Our contemporary world, as, as, as just been mentioned, Africa included, has continued to experience increasing environmental degradation, threatening the existence of lives. Intervention efforts towards preserving the environment or governing the environment have concentrated more on science and technology or scientific and technological intervention methods, leaving out other important partners. And I think our chairman has ably captured that aspect of leaving aside convention on the traditional uh, knowledges and sources. And so when we leave aside these conversations or intervention methods have been trying to leave aside or leave out what we call important partners, probably because they were thought as unnecessary, particularly the area of religion, culture, among others. Gifford, who is also a, a, a theologian writing about development, observed that Christianity is now perhaps the most salient social force in sub-Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. What Gifford is arguing is that you cannot have a conversation about improving environment or preserving environment without giving and hear to the force, which is greatly experienced in terms of Christian Christianity in Africa. Bitti, a, a renowned African uh, theologian writing on African religion, <clears throat> religions and philosophy, observes that Africans are notoriously religious. That means wherever we are coming up with, uh, with the in, um, environmental interventions, we cannot leave out religious considerations, factoring that it had this statement there, that religion permeates into all departments of life so fully that it is not easy or possible always to isolate it. So that means if we are going to have a conversation and, and talk about intervening or governing environment, 
we cannot leave out within the African context, we cannot leave out environmental, I mean, religious aspects. So this validates therefore uh, where Christianity as a key conversation partner in the environmental preservation conversation table. You cannot have that table without uh, a Christian representation, just like I'm sure the Muslims and the others will say, they will still also need to have a voice. Why is it that Christianity becomes a key partner? It is because it plays a pivotal role in discouraging and forming, shaping, and discouraging environmental degradation. Allow me very briefly, with the remaining time, to share about six ways in which Christian theology contributes particularly to the area of uh, environmental care and forming believers and the Christians and the influencing them and the discouraging the whole idea of environmental degradation. Number one, Christian theology offers what we call a biblically grounded ecological consciousness, which is highly needed, especially here in the African setting. The point I'm making here is that the, the Christian theology presents environment as a product of God's creation. And if you look at the Christian Bible scriptures, a series of repetition in the beginning, Genesis chapter one, you see that everything that God created, he affirmed it was good. And when he concluded in verse 31, that was, that's why I put it in black, uh, bold and sorry, bold, bold form, is he even said once everything was set, that God affirmed was good. The idea of goodness there, is not in terms of who benefits from the other, but how we depend on each other so that we can become whole. Creation is also presented to us as orderly. Environment, sorry, is presented to us as orderly. When we interfere with the environment, then we mean we are interfering with the order because like we read in Psalm 19, the, the environment basically presents or speaks of a God of order. So that's the first thing that Christianity or Christian theology offers to the, the wave of uh, intervention in terms of environmental interventions, um, in terms of building that consciousness. I think as Professor Abani was talking, I was thinking about myself and the days of my boyhood when we used to kill birds and, you know, some kill some birds for fun. And because we thought it was okay to do so, we lacked that environmental consciousness, even as growing from the younghood. The second level that Christian theology offers is the interconnectedness view of the nature of all creation. Christian theology offers the fact that we, creation is an entity. And so by extension, when we possess this interconnectedness view, we have what we call shared identity. We need trees which offer oxygen. We need the water in the rivers. We need food, we, they need us to do, we need to work as human beings to cultivate and build up these, to, in, to make them flourish. In this case, the concept of interconnect, interconnectedness of all creation is critical in the Christian point of view. A gentleman by the name Dinas William observes something about Africa, and I'm sure this Ambre may, may be of interest to you, that it, is, it may be Africa's role to help us see life as a single reality in which both material and spiritual dimensions have a place. So that we no longer look at ourselves as spiritual beings going to heaven, ignoring that we exist in our context. Thirdly, the third dimension in which Christian theology offers aid in this area is in the stewardship motif. Stewardship is the idea of being caregivers, caretakers. Genesis 2.15, God places man under the responsibility of human agency, pronouncing him as a caretaker, assigning him to take care of the, the, the environment. To, there are two words used there, to cultivate it and to work it, to improve it. Stewardship is basically, for me, from a Christian point of view, the organizing and the mobilizing concept towards the care of environment. It serves a very key role in organizing and mobilizing people in their thinking towards uh, the care of environment. 
Uh, for instance, it was interesting, I was reading one paper by one of our African members who was talking about communities in Africa who use the idea of the systems of totems so that they name people or clans or families under names or trees. And so it means you cannot kill or destroy that because it is an identity identifier and you have to maintain it. So stewardship can be visible there. Number four is that Christian theology encourages an appreciative approach to contextual dynamics and realities, especially in undertaking what we call Christian reflections and Christian formulations. What I call an appreciative is, uh, for those of you coming from the Christian tradition, know that we have had a challenge between the West and the African context in terms of feeling that certain things were imposed, not the, the, the Western world did not appreciate some of the things they found on the ground within the African setting. Christian theology should and is helpful because it promotes an appreciative approach to those di contextual dynamics so that the complexities on the ground, issues that people go through like suffering, poverty, their worldviews, culture, religion, become part of the considerations. That's why I repeated there the question of BT. If BT says we are notoriously religious, and religion permeates all areas, then it simply means those aspects have to be part of the conversation. We have to appreciate them. Even when we don't understand them, we have to appreciate them. And so that's why our own people are to be helped by Christian theology to embrace and then um, appreciate those traditional underpinnings. Number five is the development of an all-inclusive hermeneutic tool. I'm using a theological term there. Hermeneutics is the science and the heart of interpreting scripture. Christian theology comes as a result of interacting with the scripture because scripture is a revelation of God's word, God revealing himself through written words. How we interpret that, the way, the, the way we interpret scripture shapes a lot what we believe and how we practice it. For instance, if Christians believe we are, we are just going to heaven and they begin to interpret all scriptures in light of going to heaven without thinking how much of the environment will be involved, then our hermeneutical approach might produce a practice which is anti-environment. That is one area where Christian theology will be very useful in our time and especially in Africa in what we call, call, bring about what we call a holistic interpretation of man. We interpret scripture, we exit a man, we exit an environment, and the experience is together. So that out of all of them, we can be able to make sense of our situation and embrace a workable approach to environment. Finally, it is the witnessing aspect of the environment. If you look at what we read in Psalm 119 verse one to two, you notice scripture emphasizes the idea that environment speaks out the beauty aesthetics you know the nature of the layout are clear is clear voices if you see in my notes i call these the god's mouthpiece or in instrument of witnessing to the world telling and showing forth god's glory so environment takes more than just a role of of, of satisfying us it becomes a mouth tool or a mouthpiece through which God reveals and opens himself to us. I don't know how many times you have stepped in a place and seen some beautiful things and you stand and wow, you want to look at it and wonder how that came into being. And it points you to a greater, greater designer of these beings. So that's exactly, in a nutshell, those are six ways in which Christian theology can make a meaningful contribution to shaping its followers in terms of interacting with the environment. Because sometimes, like we said at the beginning, we may not know to interact with the environment if we lack that consciousness, if we lack that awareness. I close with this statement from Lynn White, who said, the more science and the more technology will not deliver us from the present ecological crisis until we find a new religion or rethink our old one. I believe the talk here is not about coming with a religious aspect of worship, but the idea of looking into who is that partner we are leaving aside? What is that aspect we are, not, we are supposed to consider and we are not bringing into this round table conversation?
That is my submission, Amira. I appreciate. Thank you very much, Reverend Mutuku, for making the, the case and indeed strengthening the case for those who are not um, privy to such a robust discussion about you know, what um, Christian theology says about environmental protection, uh, the need to care for our common home. And on this note, if you'll allow me to further strengthen this position by referencing uh, paragraph 13 of the papal encyclical Laudato Si Care for Our Common Home, where Pope Francis says, the urgent challenge, where in his appeal he says, the urgent, urgent challenge to protect our common home includes a concern to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development. For we know that things can change. The creator does not abandon us. He never forsakes his loving plan or repents of having created, created us. Humanity still has the ability to work together in building our common home. I invite the participants in this roundtable discussion to have a look at this seminal uh, piece of work, Laudato Si, Care for Our Common Home by Pope Francis and discover what he has to say in terms of our modern day challenges um, regarding the nature and environmental crises um, and what uh, Catholics and Christians can do. Um, it, La Dattasi is an appeal to all of humanity, in fact, um, to strengthen our connection with, uh, with nature, with the environment, so that you know, the action that we take can be accelerated towards not only the sustainable development goals, but in creating uh, a better humanity uh, and world for all of us. Now, I will admit that the next speaker um, has had some challenges connecting to this uh, to this discussion. Um, has some audio challenges, but that does not leave us without um, a speaker to represent the Islamic voice, so the voice of uh, Muslims and what faith and environment and how faith and environment is depicted in the Muslim tradition. Um, and so I'm very pleased to welcome our guest uh, here today, um, Mr. Kaman Shazad from IFIS, the um, Islamic Foundation for Environment and Ecological Sciences, to, to share a brief word. And I, I recognize and I hope to share with you all that we are putting him on the spot and this is a last minute request, but he has graciously agreed to say a few words about uh, this, this topic. Uh, so, Mr. Kaman Shazad, over to you. Okay, assalamu alaikum and good afternoon and peace and blessings be upon uh, everybody here today. Um, I, I feel like I'm a fake participant because I'm either from Europe or my origins are from South Asia. So I'm just a, a guest of Africa uh, today. But also I, I have to like on a... Um, on a personal journey, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I think I'm brave enough to admit there was there was a time where I struggled with my faith at some point, and um, and I it was in Africa where and somebody from the indigenous communities of Tanzania really helped me connect, um, reconnect with my faith. Uh, and introduced me to the concept of uh, ecological spirituality, of finding God uh, through the trees and through nature around. So that's my, my kind of connection to Africa. So I hope um, I'm amongst brothers here. So um, I, I'm sorry if my room sounds a bit echoey. Um, if it does, please, uh, please forgive me. OK, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about an Islamic perspective on nature and biodiversity and all these things. And in, in, in a famous speech, you know, delivered over a decade ago, actually, it was Prince Charles who spoke very, at the uh, Oxford University in UK, he spoke very extensively on the topic Islam and the environment. And this is, if you YouTube it, you can find his speech there. Um, and he gave a very excellent overview of what the religion of Islam says about the environment. And he mentioned two important things there. He mentioned, number one, uh, that he concluded that if people, they're more likely to care for the environment 
if they were told that this is a religious responsibility. And then secondly, he asserted that no religion stresses the importance of green matters more so than the religion of Islam. And as a Muslim, and I'm sure other Muslims here, um, for us, it's hard to disagree with him on that. Because we believe that the teachings of Islam are inherently environmental and biodiversity and nature is celebrated in the Holy Quran over and over and over again. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, championed environmental rights and concerns 1400 years ago. You know, it's not something new. It's just that maybe us as people of religion need to be more practical about it. And if we were to look, we know when we observe and, you know, our esteemed guests have already spoken about this to some degree that life on Earth is made up of these complex set of interrelated ecosystems which need to be maintained in this natural balance. For, ex for example, um, if there were no pollinating insects on Earth like bees and butterflies, then there wouldn't be any fruit. And without the plants that provide nectar and po uh, pollen, there would be no food to sustain the bees. And so bees and plants are dependent upon each other. And so many ecosystems around the whole globe rely on this wide variety of plants and animals interacting with each other, you know, which is biodiversity. And the Holy Quran mentions this balance very beautifully in Surah Rahman, where Allah says, Allah raised the heaven and established the balance so that you who would not transgress uh, the balance. Give just way and do not skimp the balance. Now here, Allah Almighty is requesting humanity to respect that balance, to acknowledge its importance for our very own existence. You know, he's asking us to maintain it. So what we take with one hand, we must give back with the other. So God is not saying, oh, don't take. Allah has given us nature to provide for us, but equally we need to return. And then if we look further um, elsewhere in the Holy Quran, it's rich of, uh, in references to the beautiful world that he has created for us. It teaches us many lessons on the protection of nature and the protection of biodiversity. And these are similar to the other uh, Abrahamic faiths. The story of Noah, for instance, peace be upon him, who was asked by God to protect all the animals before the flood. You know why? Because the animals are what sustains the world after once the flood has gone. Or the story of Prophet Solomon, Suleiman, salam, who took into consideration the plight of ants whilst uh, marching his army. And so the primary of, uh, purpose of the Holy Quran is to provide guidance for us. But most observers who, who look into the Quran will undoubtedly notice that it's a book on nature too. It pays constant nature, constant tribute to life on earth. Many of the chapters are named after animals and plants, such as Surah Al-Baqarah, the cow, Surah Al-Anam, the cattle, Surah Nahl, bees, Surah Al-Naml, ants, Surah Al-Ankabut, the spider, Surah al diyat horses, Surah Al-Feel, elephant, Surah Al-Insan, man, because quite often we uh, detach ourselves from nature. Uh, Surah at -Din, the fig, Surah Nas, mankind. You know, the Quran also asks us to reflect on how the camel was created and how the sky was raised. You know, plants also get mentioned, plants such as onions, figs, mustard, pomegranates, trees, lentils, uh, grapes, fruits, garlics, cucumbers, dates, all get mentioned in the Holy Quran. And all these are a sign of God's perfection and a reminder of the variability of life on earth. Now, as I mentioned before, it's not just on uh, land, but also our lives depend on healthy waters. The oceans, the rivers, they're all essential for the survival of life. They're the lifeline of our planet and civilization. Oceans cover two thirds of our planet and hold 97% of the planet's water. They produce more than half the oxygen in the atmosphere and absorb most carbon from it. And rivers are equally important. They also provide us with the food as well as energy, recreation, transportation routes, 
and of course water for irrigation and drinking purposes. Most settlements and most major cities around the world are built um, uh, along major rivers and Muslims are all aware of this thanks to the Quran which in many places refers to the role of oceans. So Allah says in uh, Surah 16, and Allah committed the sea to serve you, to eat from its tender meat and extract jewelry which you wear. And you see the ships roaming for your commercial benefits as you seek his bounties that you may be appreciative. So that's the sea. And then if we talk about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself was a huge advocate of protecting nature and biodiversity and the environment. At a time 1400 years ago, when there appeared to be no environmental rights or laws, he declared a 30 kilometer area around the city of Medina to be a protected sanctuary and prohibited the cutting down of trees uh, within its borders, as well as giving uh, various protection to other aspects of nature. He created what we call the Him and Harim zones. Uh, and this example is now being used um, by environmentalists around the Islamic world uh, to protect regions, threatened woodlands, grasslands, wetlands, and rangelands. Uh, and the Him and Harim aspect is spoken quite in depth in the new Al Mizan document, which is being released in a couple of months. So our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has told us that protecting the environment is an act of worship. He tells us if a Muslim plants a tree or sows a seed, uh, then a human or bird that eats from it, then it is re regarded as sadaqa jariya, as a charitable gift. Uh, he also tells us that uh, verily there is a heaven re reward for every act of kindness done to uh, living animals. Um, so there's so much. And I, I want to highlight a particular section from the Islamic Declaration uh, on Global Climate Change, which was drafted by Dr. Fazlul Khalid, the founder for the Islamic Foundation for Environmental and Ecological Sciences, where he says, we recognize that we are but a minuscule part of the divine order, yet within that order, we are exceptionally powerful beings. And we have a responsibility to establish good and avert evil in every way we can. And so finally, I just want to uh, finish on one of my favorite ayahs in the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Anam, the cattle. And in it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, and there is no creature on or within the earth or bird that flies with its wings, except that they are communities like you. We have not neglected in the register a thing, then unto their Lord they will be gathered. Now, let us reflect on that for a second, yeah? Allah here is referring to biodiversity and nature as communities. Yeah. Now, what is a community? Now, if you look in the dictionary, the dictionary defines a community as a group living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common, or a group living together and practicing common ownership. Now just reflect on that for a second. What Allah and the Almighty is saying to us that biodiversity in nature is not here for us to use and abuse. It's not for us to have dominion over. It's not for us to have control or consume, but for us to treat as a community that every single variety of plant and animal life on this planet has a role to play just as different people and humans have a role to play in communities. We're all inter interconnected and there's no getting away from that. So to conclude, the Almighty has created this magnificent world for us. Whilst we enjoy the blessings that the earth has provided for us, we also need to show responsibility for our actions. And that responsibility is manifested through our consumption, that we only use what's necessary. That, and this is reflected in maintaining that blessing that we constantly replenish what we have taken. Thank you. Sorry, I know that was a little bit more than a few minutes, but I hope I've done justice to that. Thank you. 
Indeed you have. Thank you very much, Kaman, and I, and I appreciate you stepping in at the very last minute. Um, thank you once more. So to the participants here, uh, Kaman Shazad is not only um, the director of IPs and the director of and, and founder of the Bahu Trust um, in the UK, but he is also a critical member of the core team of Almizan. And he briefly um, uh, mentioned it, but I would like to lift up um, and, and see a little bit more about what Almizan, a covenant for the earth is. And it is a, well, it, it started off as a document um, that we uh, partnered with eminent scholars on uh, creating. It out, outlines some key principles in, um, in Islam that you know, the scholars and the community, and I say community because it did go through an extensive consultative process with over 200 individuals and institutions um, to, to highlight the need um, and, and the relevance of this whole uh, subject of faith and environment protection and the need to uh, lift up our action for the environment, because as you've heard, it is important in Islam as well as Christianity. Um, and so what started off as a do document has now turned into this incredible movement where um, the scholars drafting team um, and the core team are calling on Islamic institutions and by extension uh, partners interested in exploring this area to write more about this, uh, this important piece of, of wisdom and knowledge. Um, but also to, to take these uh, principles, these values and translate them into actions that the regular person can adopt in their everyday life. And one such illustration is, was one that Sidi Fazlun, who is the, uh, who, who is the founder of IPs, mentioned at side event six of the first meeting of the focal points of the Montevideo uh, program that happened in June. Uh, which Kabak University also uh, contributed to. And what he mentioned in that side event through his, the projects that they convened in, um, in Tanzania um, on fishing using dynamites and the effect that that had on coral reefs and the, you know, the sustainability of using this method of fishing was an, an important um, statement that he made was Although the authorities time and time again had come into the community and mentioned the harmful effects both on people and uh, the coral reefs on fishing and being able to sustain themselves, um, because this is the only way they knew how to, to continue fishing um, and bringing in the fish for their livelihood, uh, it, it wasn't an action that was stopped immediately. But what Sidi Fazlun said in his um, presentation at the side event was that as soon as we engage uh, the faith leaders, the social leaders to say, you know, in Islam, this is the position that we take on protecting the environment. He said there was no way that anyone could argue with this position. And you saw slowly a transition out of um, the local fishermen using dynamite uh, to continue fishing. And that brings us to our next speaker, uh, seamless transition over who was also present um, and, and made an important um, intervention at the side event, Mr. Carson Kiburo, he, who is the director of the Jami Asila Center, uh, to kindly share with us the ageless role of indigenous beliefs in environmental conservation um, and sustainable human wildlife interactions. And so Mr. Carson Kiburo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Asmaira. I believe you can hear me. Um, thank you. Uh, I should begin by saying that it is amazing that all the outstanding speakers who have spoken ahead of me have all shared a lot of cross-cutting principles. And I believe this is because we are all part of uh, the humankind. And so I will just have a few points to share based on a few years that I've worked on on the earth and um, I believe uh, and, and as you may see from my face I'm just a young person and I have what I have learned from my elders so my name is Kiburo an indigenous rights advocate indigenous um, of the Indorize, a minority an ethnic minority in Kenya I serve and work with the 
with those ethnic communities who are minorities and who have been marginalized uh, based on, on their indigeneity. And it is not only in Kenya, but around the world. Um, I was, I believe I was born to uphold and preserve um, and transmit my people's knowledge systems for future generations as we all owe our existence to Mother Earth. Um, I'm also a student at Kabarak University School of Law, and that tells you that I'm pleased to be in the presence of my professors and faith leaders today. Uh, yeah, so uh, my point will touch on just ecological biodiversity and the life of a pastoralist, uh, because I'm a proud pastoralist. Uh, I will tell you a small ceremony that will highlight why this is important. Uh, back where I come from, uh, we, we, we petition our land into portions where uh, our elders would bless. And when I mentioned elders, that is gender diverse. Our elders would bless uh, and with a ceremony a, a certain part of the land to be, to be able to regenerate. And they would bless another one to open and we would graze our livestock there until when the other portion has regenerated or several portions, it depends on, it depended on the population. And I am using past tense because, uh, because of population and, and, and other issues such as uh, land grabbing and other issues we've, we've had a small portion remaining. So while, while growing up in my people's land, uh, the powerful law was our people's creeds. And I heard that from, um, my professor, Professor Ambani, uh, when he mentioned a few things that I was, I'm also going to mention, uh, especially with our relationship with nature, collectively as a people, uh, we'll talk about the history, the story of totems, identity and protection. And it is, this is wonderful because I heard from um, our Reverend, Reverend, uh, Reverend Justice. So, in my in my people's land, we do have quite a number of um, quite a number of clans, and each identifies uh, with a totem or a symbol. And this symbol is all about the flora and fauna. Uh, so, for instance, I will give you the story that, that my identity, uh, my mother's people, identify uh, with the crane, uh, the bird. You know the, the the one that is on the emblem of uh, the people of your, uh, the the government of Uganda, and uh, my father's lineage identifies with the moon, and we have, for example, for we have other other lineages that identify with lion, um, the jackal, uh, the, the the buffalo, and all that. Uh, but the reason why I'm saying this is that. Um, in our relationship with nature, those totems have a special uh, place in their protection and, and, and how we relate in terms of, uh, for instance, for highly warning signs, uh, as they read, for instance, the galaxy and all that. I wouldn't go deep into that. Uh, but also, it is important to mention that the effects of westernization and the faith dress code and education, all that, we've, we've mentioned all that, because all these are foreign, uh, even the language that we're using. Uh, but what we seem to have left is the faith-based religious ethics uh, that we have, you know, by, um, as we have bioculturally envisaged since time in memorial, uh, which we have kept, and, and these have kept this mother earth. And humankind, which our creator bestows onto humankind, to take care of uh, our people, and respectfully, I can pass the blame on the imperial money system, uh, which has sustained, which has sustained the neo-colonial systems. How people uh, have done. Uh, I would. I, I should be careful to use the 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 the, the language that I want to use. That um, atrocious. Uh, the 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 destroyed behalf. And these has exacerbated the consequences of leaving our biological biodiversity as part of our life ways. Uh, for instance, uh, for my people, the creed almost uh, is, and I heard from our previous speaker, 
sorry that I forgot your name, Kamran. Uh, is only to take what you need and no wastage. Right now, because of the inefficient government policies, we are forced to leave sustainable, uh, unsustainable life ways to choose a new system that doesn't take care of the planet, that puts pro profit before exist for existence with nature. So this is not a lamentation. I'm just giving a case in point of what's going on. Um, so for instance, cutting down centuries old tree to burn a charcoal, which uh, bought the money and charcoal did not last for over a year. And uh, I am interested to hear in the next session, uh, the gov how governments have responded uh, through the laws uh, to indigenous knowledge on climate change and land use, for instance, and the position of uh, indigenous customary law in environmental Theme. So uh, I'm curious to hear from outstanding scholars who will come in the next session. And I will leave you uh, to ponder on the plight of Africa uh, viewed on this lens of uh, faith and ethics. Um, as, uh, as I'm leaving you to ponder on this plight of Africa as viewed from uh, Professor Halima Sui's ideas in his book, uh, The Africans, A Triple Heritage. Uh, which he interprets the three faiths um, that are here, the African faith, um, Islam, and Christianity. Uh, with that, Asmaira, I submit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carson. Um, that was fantastic. And to borrow from the thinking or the, the explanation that you, um, the intervention that you just made, um, I'm pleased to share with you that on the 26th of July, um, we're having a conversation that sort of um, moves along the lines that we we have established here, um, especially in your intervention, Carson, where we're looking at the need, um, well, we're looking at ways to drive action for um, and in support of sustainable urban areas um, towards the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And this conversation, although it's global in nature and, and talks about you know, the need for ecosystem services in these very densely packed urban spaces, um, this conversation in particular takes a step back uh, to look at why it is that a city like Mombasa um, has little to no uh, green spaces, public spaces available to the, the public um, that, that are um, open access to, to all. Um, and that's because of its complex colonial history. Um, and so we have a very interesting um, academic who is part of the panel on the 26th who uh, will demonstrate how British, Portuguese, um, the Arab rule has influenced, you know, not only the way, the location in which churches, mosques and temples are currently placed, um, but also, you know, why, why it, why they are in, uh, why they are located in their different areas, and what that means to um, to the availability of, of land and access to uh, common spaces, and and what impact this has on on the people. Um, and so, with that, I believe that brings us to the end of the first session. Um, and with that, I do hope that we can open the floor for question and answers. And I just want to check with Carson um, to see if we have 15 minutes as initially allocated for Q&A um, or perhaps 10. Uh, sorry, not Carson, Samson, apologies for that. No problem, Asmara, thank you. Uh, I think we can do 10. Okay. Uh, in light. Uh, and so I welcome anybody in the participants uh, present here today to lift, to raise their hand um, and we shall call on you to pose your question. But uh, something it seems like we have a shy audience. Uh, Mr. Sipala, please. Hi everyone, um, and th thanks for, for, for the time for the question. I'd like to ask a question which I think I'm trying to foreshadow the conversation that I, I my own uh, contribution in the next few minutes. And that is around 
um, I don't know what the different speakers could tell us about what their religions say about our duty to participate in public policy making um, with the relevance of the of the faith uh, values that it teaches us. Um, because um, I'm curious to, to begin to foreshadow the conversation around as faith believers, um, how do we then begin to impact on public policy making on environment? But then I was wondering, do, do we have general principles of our faith that encourage us to participate in good government? Reverend Mutuku, I wonder if we can start with a response from you. Yes, um, Samson, uh, uh, sorry. Um, Ambre, I think there's one of the biggest challenge we have is um, we've not had policy seen as an issue of the common persons. It has been initially seen as the, the take of the elites up there. But I do not think, I have been involved in several policy uh, engagements uh, and I don't think Christianity has any problem with that because that is part of our calling to exercise our responsibility as the light of the world. But I think what probably might be is that this is becoming a new way of incorporating uh, teams within this. There's a way that uh, policy making has been relegated to professionals in quotes. Eh? And, and so you, you, we've not had like an opposition from Christian side where they feel it's not. But I also don't think lots of men of Christians have thought about in terms of engagement with policy making, and, and that would be something Christianity would, would advocate. I think Jesus, in all the scriptures, Moses from the Old Testament, going to the prophets, to the kings, we see a lot of a participation and involvement of uh, believers in coming up with what would aid societies to become better. So I would think Christianity, the Christian side will have no problem with the participation in the policy making because that, that serves the needs for humanity and we are part of that society which we talk about. So representation there would not be an issue for, from a Christian point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Mutuku. And Carson, would you like to um, respond to Ms. Isabella's question? Yeah. I see, I see that uh, the government has started listening to our own uh, policies, and I don't want to, to call them traditional knowledge systems. I will quote the, the, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, who calls, who wouldn't want to say indigenous, traditional, indigenous, traditional, uh, traditional knowledge systems. Uh, he says that this is science and it's on the same platform. And I see the government of Kenya has tried to do that uh, just on the baby steps anyway, uh, because we see the meteorological department involving now uh, these methods that I mentioned, for instance, uh, climate, highly warning signs on climate change, uh, because our people use it, knew and they still know and they have this knowledge but of course because of the westernization this being told that uh, we've been told that our life ways our, our knowledge systems our science is dark or it's witchcraft and so but now the government realizes that they we have that knowledge and i'm speaking as a young person uh, humbly because i know these people they exist and we the government now reaches out to them and they involve them in um, in, in their policy making processes or when they are drafting their own um, policy bridge or how they do this. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I was just mentioning one part, uh, but there are so many other ways that the government or the other partners like the UN could come in or, and then to, to pick this knowledge that has not been utilized uh, because as I mentioned in my presentation, we're part of the humankind, all of us, and we have something to, to, to volunteer, I mean, to, that we have used for thousands of years, uh, but has been disregarded. And, uh, and the, every, everyone right now realizes, for instance, in terms of biodiversity, that the indigenous peoples do have uh, the best practices uh, in 
conservation, and I, I am using the word conservation carefully because it's, it is a foreign concept. It's a, it's a foreign idea. Conservation, for example, uh, the issue of saying that this place has to be protected. For us, living with nature is one and the same thing. But so the destruction uh, needs to be reconstructed again and to include the, these voices that we have today here. Thank you. If I may briefly state, um, and, and this goes back to the to you know, faith for its strategy and engaging faith actors. And of course, when we say faith, we mean religious as well as spiritual you know, leaders, institutions and communities. Uh, but noting that already uh, faith-based institutions have a long-standing history uh, with that, with the respective community that they are a part of. Um, and so they have established networks uh, speaking to areas of uh, humanitarian aid, social and economic uh, functions within society and you know, for that community, um, ETC. And so what we see here is a faith institution in a unique position um, to not only uh, speak to uh, persons of different so socioeconomic backgrounds um, and a different uh, of different education um, and e even living in different areas, uh, but also leverage these institutions that are already engaged um, substantively in a lot of uh, thematic areas, as I mentioned, um, to contribute in a in a substantive way about what is going on at a grassroots and a local level um, and, le and lend that support. Um, and of course, one example that we can share uh, that speaks to this is that of the Interfaith the Rainforest Initiative and the excellent work that they're doing in uh, Brazil, in DRC, in Peru, in working in leveraging the faith institutions and working with indigenous peoples, ETC, so that it's a comprehensive community approach uh, and a value-based approach to um, influencing policy at a local level, um, and as well as injecting these views at a very uh, global and you know in a robust way at a national and a global uh, level. Um, and with that, I did see Faith's hand come up very quickly and then back down. So Faith, I wonder if you still have a question for the panel, um, and if you could direct it to the speaker? Uh, actually, as Amaira, I was just contributing to what Amfrey Sipala mentioned. So I'm writing my contribution on the chat. So that's why I removed there and yeah. Great, thank you. And one last hand from Anesmus Musungu. Um, Anesmus, please. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the insightful presentation from our various presenters. Of course, it's an eye-opening presentation that helps us to relate between faith and environment. However, I would like to ask a question with regards to uh, genetically modified organism, that is GMO, and how religion perceives GMO. Because uh, I believe uh, I believe in the closing statements by Reverend Justice. He talked about new religion and rethinking out the old one. And we understand that religion has, we have been having a mixed debate with regards to the, de to the development of GMOs and how they help in improving the environment whereby we develop, we develop different organisms that is plants so that they can fit into the climate connotation that we are in. Therefore, I would like to hear uh, their view with regards to religion and GMO and how we can correlate the two, that is science and uh, religion. Thank you very much. Um, so Onesmas, um, I ask you to please put your question in the chat um, and we'll have the, the previous speakers respond to that um, as, uh, as well as Sospita Lutala, if you could please ask your question in the chat because I am cognizant that we have run out of time for uh, the question and answer. And with that, Samson, I do hand the floor back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Azmaira. Uh, sincere apologies to the rest of the participants that uh, we have to rush. But uh, thank you so much to the previous speakers for sharing the insights on the connection between uh, the various faith systems 
and uh, environmental protection. And I believe had we more time, we'd explore more than just uh, Christianity, Islam, and indigenous faiths. But uh, in the interest of time, allow me to usher us into session two, where we shall be looking into the interdisciplinary aspect, uh, particularly in cementing approaches in international law. And uh, for this session, allow me to welcome uh, Sharon Amwama, my colleague, to chair us through. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Mushiri, can, can I be heard? Uh, my name is Sharon Amwama. I work together with Samson Mushiri. I would like to once again welcome all of us to this uh, dialogue on faith and environmental. 18 provides that uh, uh, the Bible says that we should come and reason together. And as Kabarak University, we are glad to have you here with us as we move towards a faith-based solution to the problems that face our environment. I urge all of us to realize and constantly remind ourselves that we are part of the environment and that this is for our benefit. This conversation is particularly exciting for me because early in January, we had a conversation on inter interdisciplinary reflections. And I'm glad that we are effecting this by having a discussion with the religious leaders in an aim to find solutions to an environmental problem. I would like to, uh, to start by thanking all of our presenters for their wonderful presentation. And due to the constraints of time, I would start by um, inviting Ms. Sandra Soy to uh, make her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And good afternoon to everybody. I hope we are all having a good day. Uh, we are enjoying the discussion so far, and we are learning from each other. Um, now, I'm going to present on international environmental law and faith, and uh, we're going to look at a historic perspective. And to begin, I'm going to give a quote. I don't know who said it, but it is, uh, we can say it's a cliche that those who don't learn from history are bound to repeat it. And I want uh, us to learn, and uh, the, the lessons that we're going to learn um, on the development of international environmental law from history, they are positive, uh, these are positive lessons. Eh? And we need to learn from those positive lessons in order to avoid the mistakes that we have been making uh, these past few years or the past few decades uh, in regards to environmental conservation. So when we look at the development of international environmental law, there is a period where we refer uh, where we refer to this development as the early glimmers period or the traditional period. And this is essentially the period before the 1972 Stockholm Conference. And it goes back up to as early as the 19th century. And environmental concerns during this time were rooted or deeply rooted or embedded in religious practices um, by major religions as we know, today and also by indigenous practices. And for instance, when we look at the Judeo-Christian uh, traditions, they believe that God made man uh, the steward of us. He gave man the responsibility to take care of us. And I believe also in other religions, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, uh, and all other religions that we, all major religions that we have today, when they look at their canons, they are able to see that uh, we all agree that the responsibility to take care of us uh, was given by a divine, by a divine power, and that is what um, guided um, environmental conservation before development of laws. Then. Um, we can also see that with indigenous practices, uh, how indigenous practices uh, contributed is, indigenous practices contributed to uh, what we know as indigenous knowledge. When we look at, our, for instance, the Convention on Biodiversity um, we, and also our own biodiversity strategic plans and biodiversity um, policies, for instance, in Kenya, there is a reference to indigenous knowledge. and. This is a contribution from indigenous practices and indigenous traditions. So um, the development of 
the I mean, so the development of uh, international environmental law also, uh, when we look at the early conventions, uh, specifically early conventions and agreements that were concluded before 1972. Uh, I am stressing the fact before 1972 because this is when now we see the inception of international environmental law, there's the Stockholm Conference, and then um, there's the Rio Conference and environmental law as we know it today. But before this, when we look at 1990, like in the 19, 1900, there is a convention in the 1900 uh, on the conservation of various species of wildlife, uh, of wild animals in Africa that are useful to man or that are inoffensive. This was concluded in London in 1900. And such, okay, uh, although the motivation behind it was for commercial value, uh, but still these were early conventions that were, <clears throat> that were um, inspired by historical practices, that is religious practices, indigenous practices. Then it is important to note that in 1968, there was the African Convention um, on the conservation of nature and, and natural resources, which is a pan-African drive uh, for a strategic framework uh, in delivering Africans go Africa's goal uh, for inclusive, sustainable development. This was concluded before Stockholm. And um, when I read through, or when I read through this con convention, it's, it's uh, it's very heartwarming to know that as African states we had already gotten a focus or vision that we needed a strategic goal and a strategic framework in order for us to um, conserve our environment for our future generations. Um, this was even before you know the the, the term sustainable development by the uh, Brutland report was coined, but. I mean, as Africans, we had that vision. And it also stresses the fact that our indigenous knowledge also contributes to, our indigenous knowledge contributes to um, um, how we conserve our biodiversity, which is very important because, you know, but when we look um, in a broad spectrum, when we look at our biodiversity, we, as we see um, um, contributions to medical technology. Um, these indigenous plants, um, indigenous shrubs, uh, we can extract certain components of such uh, in such plants and that contribute to medical technology, uh, the development of drugs and such. Yeah, so this is the prehistoric, let um, me sorry, or the historic perspective. Then we cannot discuss history without discussing the future. When you look at postmodern, laws and policies after now the Stockholm Convention came in and now people, states globally were aware of environmental conservation. We find that we put the matters of uh, faith and religious practices and indigenous practices uh, on hold for a little while. Yeah? We thought now, okay, now we are sort of educated or elite or or we give science, um, we give science the lead and forgot about the traditional practices. And in my own opinion, um, I believe that this is what got us into the environmental problems, environmental problems that we are seeing today, because um, of what we, of what I, what is referred as the anthropocentric uh, view of the environment where we see ourselves as humans being superior than other non-human nature. Um, however, uh, there is hope for humankind. The, uh, in Bolivia, um, they introduced um, the rights of Mother Earth. And these rights advocate for an ecocentric relationship between human and non-human life. So when we look uh, from an indigenous premise, um, we are all part of Mother Earth as equals. So no part of nature is superior to the other. So humans and uh, trees and hills and valleys and lakes, they all relate to each other. They 
exist together in sort of in a kind of a symbiotic relationship. So because essentially human and humans and nature were meant to work holistically uh, for their own benefits, you know, in a symbiotic relationship, sort of. Then from a religious point of view, also, this rights appeal to the various religious um, ideals, philosophies, morals, and, and moral codes. Um, for instance, to quote um, or to paraphrase St. Francis of Assisi, uh, when he said that um, there is equality of all creatures, uh, and he referred to the sun, the earth, the wind, and the waters as brothers and sisters. So religious practices, um, religious practices and, and indigenous practices, because in those indigenous religions and then the major religions as we know them today, have contributed um, to the inter to environmental laws as we have them today. And um, looking at uh, where we have come from and where we are headed with initiatives of you know, faith and us for conservation, then we can reintroduce them back into our laws. For instance, when we look at um, the Environmental Management and Coordination Act, for instance, in Kenya, there is no mention of faith or religious and environmental practices or, or religious conservation practices or indigenous conservation practices. So these are components that we need to not only include in our laws, but also include in our lifestyles, in uh, our policies, uh, in order to advance uh, environmental conservation. So yeah, that is my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Soy, for your wonderful presentation. <clears throat> I, particularly I particularly like the quote of those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And recently I, I was watching a movie where this statement was being said to children and they kept on repeating it because the last two words they repeat it. So I think it would be prudent enough if us as individuals who are having this conversation keep repeating it just in order to affect the discussions we have today. Um, <clears throat> I agree that as Africans, we have always had this vision and that we gave science the lead, but I think it is also high time that we take back control over it, or rather we um, work together to make our environment better. Um, from the wise quotes of uh, Professor William Mutunga, he keeps on uh, repeating that uh, the past is indeed never past, it is also the future. So. I would like to thank you for our presentation, for um, realizing that we need to look at the past so we can be able to uh, look into the future. Um, I would also like the audience to reflect on the story of Noah after the floods. God promised to never again destroy the earth. And I think uh, such a promise is one uh, that us as individuals, as part of the environment, should be able to reflect on. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Humphrey Sipala, the Editor-in-Chief of Kabarak University Press, to make a presentation on recognizing faith principles and values in public policy making, the case of the East African community, environment regulation. Welcome, Mr. Sipala. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Amuama. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, um uh, Sandra, I hope, I hope I'm audible. So, yes, so you are. thank you. Um, so yeah, thank 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 you so much for those who have spoken before me. Um uh, uh, really covered much of the ground that um I, I would have been the background to my conversation. This allows me to jump straight into to the conversation. Um let me begin by touching on something that uh, Dr. Yad mentioned at the beginning. Um, and and as Myra has mentioned about about um, the the idea that, that we 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 should now begin to think about how to impact public policy making and think of encouraging conversations, scholarly, interreligious, interdisciplinary conversations. I have been very 
encouraged by responses when we began to, 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 to reach out to the public and say, we're going to have this event. And number of people asked me, so, so what, does, what, does, what does this mean? Um, so, and, and this reminded me that it's, it's important that we continue to speak about how faith principles guide us in environmental protection. It's not always obvious. It's not always spoken to. Um, I think our conversation today, we could think about it in the sense of um, whether the, the secular state is inimical to faith-based environmental protection principles. Um, I guess we, we, my argument here is that uh, faith, um, from the example that, for instance, uh, C.D. Fazlun gave at the side event that uh, Asmaira was speaking about, faith is a strong driver of behavior change. And when confronted with a triple planetary crisis, uh, we, we probably should look to a force that can drive um, behavior change like faith. Um, and, 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 and therefore his usefulness is, is, is potent as we consider the next few decades of, of environmental, of human interaction with the environment and what principles will drive it. Um, I'm also encouraged because uh, from the conversations that, um, that, that Sandra has had, we, we, she mentioned about the 1968 African Convention on Conservation of Nature, uh, which I think is an excellent example of, or again, how the, the, the orthodox textbooks in international law begin the story of international environmental law from 1972, forgetting that there was an African treaty. And, and so it, from the point of view of African approaches to international law, um, there is a lot to be learned about how we can think about how there are hidden stories behind the lawmaking at the international and national level. Um, as we're thinking through how to drive this scholarly conversation forward, uh, we had interesting conversations and one of our partners uh, told us, hey, but wait a minute, why don't you start with your neighborhood? neighborhood here being the East African community. And so we began to ask ourselves, could we have a quick look at the East African community and see since its reinception in the year 2000, what has it done around environment that has involved faith? So um, in a session chair, if you just allow me to briefly share a document um, on our, which will just capture what we, we tried to do. I must thank um, Alex Tamei, Caleb Kipkorir, and David Arita, and Lorraine Chantai for assisting with this research. It was, we tried to cover as much of the legislation of this African community as exists. And so we began with the treaty, obviously, on the treaty uh, to the East African community, establishing the East African community. And um, the articles 1, 2, 111 to 114 of the treaty are the ones that speak about environmental uh, regulation. And let me draw your attention to article 112 2E, which speaks about the community's con obligation to adopt environmentally sound management techniques for the control of land degradation, such as soil erosion, desertification, and forest encroachment. 112 2L to adopt community environmental management programs, which I thought was an opportunity for the treaty to recognize what are these communities. They are communities that are existing, as Professor Mazrui taught us in the Triple Heritage Theory, in the cusp of the Africa's Triple Heritage of Islam, Christianity, and religious beliefs. Uh, a, a traditional indigenous beliefs. And, and, and I look at article 1122L and ask myself, this provision would have been an excellent opportunity to remind ourselves that we should approach environmental management with a faith-based angle. Um, there's article 1122M, that seeks to promote enhancement of the quality of the environment through adoption of common measures and programs. So common meaning between the countries, the states of the East African community. 
and programs of tree planting, afforestation, reforestation, soil conservation, and recycling of materials. It's interesting again, because uh, then there was just a brief mention of the community and then the, 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 the beliefs of the community that live around and, and do this tree planting and afforestation and soil conservation seems to disappear. Um, on the management of natural resources, which is article, I think, 114, there's, there's a strong language on conservation and preservation. But again, um, what we found was that there was no reference to belief systems and to local community values that would drive this kind of preservation. Um, then we jump to the acts and bills of the East African Legislative Assembly. Um, so there's an act in 2006, largely about quality assurance, meteorological testing and meteorological testing and, and just makes a mention of the environment because it's meteorological. Um, uh, Carson spoke about how uh, government Kenya is now beginning to interact with indigenous communities on meteorological questions uh, here. And so unfortunately there's no reference to this. The East African Disaster, Man uh, Disaster Risk uh, Re and Reduction Management Bill um, makes reference to environment, nothing to fit. Uh, the African Community Transboundary Ecosystems Management Bill of 2020, section three, another section that on the face of it, I look at it and I wonder, this could be an, would have been a good opportunity to think about transboundary ecosystems. You should have, we could have spoken about community and, 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 and the faith beliefs that, um, that, that would drive this sense of sound ecosystem management. Um, again, it wasn't there. There's human rights community, the East African community human rights and human and people's rights bill. Um, speaks about faith, but not in the context of environment. Uh, the gender equality and development bill speaks about environmental awareness, um, but does not link it with faith. This, uh, this African community prohibition of female gen genital mutilation uh, speaks to harmonization of laws um, makes reference to cultural practices, uh, but uh, clearly this is not in the context of environment. So, uh, yeah. so I'm just going through the, the, the bills that may have had a conversation about either faith or environment. And there was the East African Community Mining Bill. Um, another piece of legislation that it would seem to me is germane to, to consider the faith beliefs of our communities that where, where mining may be happening. And this is not just on land, but one can think of the communities at the coast who live off the ocean. Kamran um, come, come has already spoken to us about, about um, the Quran's uh, exhortation of the sea. And, and, and so we know that our communities uh, have faith principles around both land and sea and environment as it. Um, an excellent opportunity to have had some conversation on faith, nothing as well. The, the two cases uh, at the East African Court of Justice that dealt with environment, no reference to faith. And this preliminary research, our aim was really to, to think through practically, what were the opportunities? Where are the opportunities where we can participate as faith actors in public policy making and have those principles have gotten ignored or lost and, and how can we begin to think of, of impacting that kind of space. Um, the, the conversation that Kabarak University Press in partnership with UNEP Faith for Earth hopes to encourage, particularly among African scholars, but obviously with interaction as scholars, we, we have a global platform and we think and we are taught and we learn from communities across the world. Um, the, the research agenda of, of, of Kabarak University Press in this engagement seeks to see how we can do, cre we can create a platform so these conversations to be had so that we normalize interreligious and interdisciplinary conversations on faith-based principles and their impact on the environment. Um, we are lucky and excited, we're excited to be in a university community. A university community by its nature is interdisciplinary. Uh, there's more than one discipline being taught. The community indeed in our societies in, in Kenya, 
around much of Africa are multi-religious. And so they give us an opportunity to have that conversation. There is also a transgenerational community. And so all the different components that impact on faith based on, on, on environment protection and environment um, uh, conservation principles are present in the university space. And that is why I guess uh, Scarborough University Press were excited to be engaging in this kind of conversation um, so that we can advance that which has not been, we think, as much advanced as, as, as has not been spoken as much as, much as should, should have been. Um, in light of that, uh, one of the components of one of the research activities we hope to be carrying out over the next 12 months is to put together what we are calling the African uh, Faith and Environment Yearbook, which will be a scholarly periodical whose aim will be to be precisely that platform where scholars can have these conversations, can present their research and participate in building the knowledge necessary to impact public policy. Um, we will be issuing the call for papers as we close this meeting um, and it will be available on our, on, on our social media um, um, spaces. And we are looking forward to engaging with colleagues and thank all the participants who have been here to, to see how to continue those conversations. We hope to first go to publication in, June, in May next year um, and continue to encourage the conversations moving forward. We certainly are eager to see how we can have a second uh, scholarly conversation like this one, uh, which obviously we will, as we work through, we'll, we'll, we'll be announcing about. Um, but yeah, that brings me to the end of my conversation. Um, really based by saying that I, I, I think we of the firm belief that um, asserting the space for faith-based principles in environmental protection and regulation is not negating the separation, the principle of separation of church and state. Um, the, 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 the secular state allows us a political space, not where religion is not recognized, but where other religion can, all religions can play a part in, all faiths can play a part. In. And, and it is that approach to, to owning our societies and owning our, the government of our communities that we, that we, we see the this, this space of faith-based principles in impacting public policy on environmental protection. Uh, Amwama, over to you. Um, thank you, Mr. Sipala, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Earlier on, when we began uh, this conversation, the first session, Mr. Iyad had mentioned that the most important thing is to begin nationally and regionally. And uh, I think we can all agree at this point that there has been a meeting of minds and that we are moving together. So I would like to thank you for uh, the reflections of the East African Community Law that focuses on the treaty provisions as well as the bills and the case law. And um, now that we have established that there are indeed, there is indeed a lacuna in regional laws in the role of faith and culture and, and how impactful it can be if we have it in our provisions, um, then um, uh, we, we, we are encouraged to engage in, in, in working on research to enable that such uh, laws are encapsulated into uh, the provisions as well as the bills. Um, without further ado, I'd like to invite um, questions from the audience. Alex Tamei. Um. Hello everyone. So mine is a mine is a question of perspective. As um, as Mr. Sipala had pointed out, there seems to be a gap in considering the effect that uh, faith could have in legislation and in policy making. So, if 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 we take an approach of solution based thinking, how can we ensure that? When we have put measures, when we have put measures in place, 
to integrate faith into policy and legislation making process how can we ensure that it will remain a fundamental part because an issue with um, you, you, with the utilization of faith and uh, by extension religion in the perception and in the creation of systems and institutions is uh, religion and faith are very prone to interpretation different interpretations can lead to completely different parts of perception completely different parts of action and in the worst case scenario can end up being counterintuitive so how do we make sure that it transcends perception and remains cemented in our processes of policy making legislation and even fundamental thought of our society uh, thank you, Alex. Um, can we have a question from another member of the audience before I pass over to Mr. Sipala to address the question? Okay, Mr. Sipala, if you could address the question. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I'm hoping also probably, I don't know whether Sandra would agree with these views. Um, but I guess, again, also, maybe just also probably hear from 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 the, the other speakers from the other session. My sense is that the, what what Reverend Mutuku spoke, has, spoke to us as the, you know, the wrong hermeneutics, uh, interpretation of faith and, 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 and the scripture is certainly something to to be cautious of. Um, uh, I, I think the the teachings of of of, of Laudato Si and and and, and um, Al Mizan are central in asserting what is the proper hermeneutics. So that rather than I mean I think that ignorance uh, of, of what is good hermeneutics, of what is good interpretation of our faith principles is a key driver in wrong interpretations. And so the more we speak about, uh, the more we learn, the more we, we engage and with the ignorance by reaffirming that they are positive belief, um, principles, the, um, the more we directly engage with the risk and mitigate the risk of 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 um, of, of uh, yeah what you call you know um, counterproductive uh, interpretations of faith. Um, yes, I mean, and, and a good example. I mean, just on, off the cuff. I mean, um, from a point of of translation, one can see in the Christian tradition that man was either charged to have dominion over nature. Or was charged to be steward of nature. Um, that change of term gives a responsibility or an opportunity to exploit, and 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 so engaging proactively to assert, to teach, to to to, and, and that's why the projects like Almizan and, and Laudato Si are, are are exciting contributions to human knowledge um, because they help us alleviate that and mitigate those risks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sipala. If we could also have Ms. Sandra to address the question and then followed by uh, Reverend Justice Mutuku. Ms. Soy? Yes, yes. Um, so for, you see, um, faith or faith-based approaches, um, they, 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 um, they assist in the conservation of not only environment, but also preserving um, religious identity. So faith-based approaches can be, you know, but we can learn faith-based approaches um, <clears throat> to formulate policies and laws uh, and create a new international order. Um, we can in, we can incorporate faith-based policies in 
you know, because we can see faith based policies are more ethically driven and more consistent. Um, they are less contradictory. Uh, so we can use them as a base for introduction of new policy for environmental conservation and, uh, you know, um, because they have a way of impacting law, international law agreement as we saw in my presentation that they impacted um, international law agreements um, um, because of their, you know, the philosophical, the philosophical points of philosophical principles of these faith and religious practices. So, yeah, um, I think, um, I don't know if that has answered the question in short. Uh, yeah, but the effort of putting um, faith-based principles or faith-based um, philosophies uh, and learning them and including them in our policies and agreements, um, I think would be a better way for environmental conservation. Sharon, back to you. I hope I've answered the question Alex asked. Thank you so much, Ms. Soy. Uh, we can now have Ms. Uh, Reverend Mutuku addressing the question. I, I guess I want to agree with uh, my brother, uh, Humbre, that uh, the only thing I want to add there is uh, faith-based approaches are, are great, but the fear that exists in many people is the, the kind of uh, interpretation or rules we use, like I think Mr. Spall has mentioned the circle, I don't want to remember this it again, because if, if, if we go for faith-based innovations based on the wrong interpretation, then you can see the mess that can be. So I, I do not have time on this to talk about hermeneutics, but maybe as we expound and as we do the, the larger paper, I can expound on the centrality of hermeneutics in building a strong, sustainable uh, Christian interventions, because hermeneutics is a core business, is a core issue on that. Thank you, Sipala, for highlighting that for us. Um, thank you so much, and thanks to all the speakers. So, as we have established, that we need to have um, religion-based policies uh, in order to uh, get a solution to our environmental problems. I urge us that even as we engage in uh, the discourse on law the, and policy that we push it to the end. Because um, uh, once, once we make this possible, let's come together again and effect what we put down. You know, they say equal ground between it different. However, it's my contention that we can change that phrase, that we can be at the forefront of the battle. I will conclude by saying that the time to act is now, and I'd like to thank all of you for um, attending uh, this roundtable. Back to you, Mutiri. Can I make a quick comment? And I wanted uh, Spala to clarify that very briefly eh, on policy, because he has something very important. Is that acceptable? Okay. Uh, it's okay. yeah, 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 Mr. Spala, I was just wondering, uh, the, 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 the practice is that the policies require a lot of elite involvement. And, and I wonder how much, how do we tame the, the elite influence where they collect data from the non-elites, the, the, the community who don't have the technicalities and technical skills. How do we control the manipulating those information for their benefit? Because I think it's one thing to engage the locals and the community, but it's another thing to get faithful um, policy developers who are elites who are able to capture that because they can easily manipulate all they want that captured. I, I was just curious to hear what your observation on that. Yeah, thanks, Robo. That's a very difficult question. I, I, I don't know if I have an answer for that. I, it's certainly a concern. Um, I think when, when it comes to the actual, uh, 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 I don't want to use the term politics, but the actual mechanics of, of policy making, um, uh, then, then we are one has to think closely about allies and, and, and which allies are trusted and which ones are not. Um, uh, gosh, I, I, but yeah, that's a very difficult question. Um, off the cuff, one of the things I think one could always that we we could always do is is, is put down rec record record hermeneutics record um, 
the 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 actual thoughts and and positive faith beliefs so that so that when when it is not when it is misinterpreted when it is misquoted when it is misused one can always come back and say no almizan was quite clear or laudato si was quite clear but i think that would be my quick response about that okay thank you Hello, thank you very much to our speakers and especially to our audience for those uh, thought-provoking questions. Uh, at this point, uh, we seem to be bound by time. I, I really appreciate our attendance. I am forced to close this conversation, but I believe the word is pause as we intend to continue with uh, these deliberations. And uh, we hope to invite you for further, uh, for further conversations in future on how to implement effective ways, particularly faith-based ways of our environmental protection. Uh, as I close, allow me to carry out this small mental exercise that um, I did participate in sometime beginning of this year in a similar event. That uh, it is not religious, but if we could all close our eyes, as I am doing right now, and for a few seconds, picture a healthy environment a good environment. Okay. And I, I have but one question for each one of us as we open our eyes. Did anyone see our himself or herself in the pictured environment? No, I did, didn't. Uh, <laughs> did anyone of us see any human beings in the environment? Uh, it's my sincere hope as you continue with these conversations and deliberations that we'd be able to fit ourselves into the perfect picture or the perfect environment that we all imagine and contemplate. Uh, so at this point, allow me to welcome the closing remarks from our editor-in-chief here at the Kabarak University Press, uh, Mr. Humphrey Sipala, after which uh, we shall call it a successful roundtable. Thank you, Mr. Sipala. Some, I, I, mine is just a quick vote of thanks. I, I, I closed my eyes and opened my eyes and I did not see myself in it. Um, uh, so I, I need to do some introspection myself. Um, uh, Kabarak University Press is deeply honored that, that you have joined us uh, for the two hours and, and engaged in our conversations. Um, most thankful to, to, to my, my Dean, Prof. Zambani. Uh, to, to Dr. Yad, uh, who we have been having great conversations and engaging in each other's uh, side events. And we're journeying together and, and, and thank you so much for joining us. We, we pulled you out of your vacation. We're so thankful for your time. Um, it was Myra too, uh, as well. Um, and Eric Muhi, I, I saw you coming in as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kamran, Kam for, for stepping in for my Ustad. Uh, we start Dr. Hassan was unable to join us today, but you, you, you stepped in last minute. We're so thankful. This is really the sense of community that I think we're beginning to build with each other. Uh, we are honored. Uh, to everybody who's made comments in, 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 and the questions, uh, we're so thankful. Um, very curious to follow up on the, on the Lesotho case study and uh, Mekosur. Thank you so much, Ainaro, for, 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 for your information. Um, uh, just for Molo, my colleague um, uh, actually mentions and reminds us that uh, public policy, public participation is now a requirement under the Constitution of Kenya, which is another space where one can think how to involve communities and bring their faith principles. So uh, we've had a very nice, short, engaging conversation. Thank you so much for all of us for joining. You have honored us. We look forward to engaging more with you on Twitter. Please reach out to us. Um, we will be posting the call for papers uh, on our social media handles, and um, yeah, we, we we let's let's grow let's grow this conversation and and learn and grow together. Thank you so much, Sam, um, as as Myra and 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 uh, Sharon for session chairing. Thank you so much, my colleague Sandra, um, uh, Carson. Thank you so so much, everybody. Thank you all and uh, good evening from this side of the world. <laughs>